All right, people are uh, feeling ready? You woken up yet? Who's asleep still? You're asleep? Okay, get out of here. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's get back to topic. So let's continue from a few days ago. Um, so uh, what do we do two days ago? So I talked about this magical parameterization called uh, maximal update or mu parameterization which has these two properties that are really crucial for scaling large neural networks, the stability of optimal hyperparameter and the larger is better property. And uh, on uh, real models of a variety of scale and uh, types, uh, we see that you know, compared to manually tuning the model, the improvement due to mu transfer increases with the model size and uh, the cost of using mu p mu transfer decreases to zero with the, the model size. Uh, so essentially it's a free lunch uh, for large enough model. Um, and then I talked a little bit about some of the intuition uh, behind mu p. So it gave you a very simple example using NLP. And then with that example in mind, I presented you this, ta this table that describes uh, what mu p actually is, but you know, we can only really get so much intuition in a very short amount of time. Um, so for the first part of uh, this uh, first lecture of today, I'll talk about how should we understand mu p, like, like you know, more thorough understanding uh, of this parameterization. <clears throat> so the starting point will be that we should just uh, from first principles, consider what are the criteria or desiderata uh, that that would uh, indicate a good parameterization, a good way of scaling your neural network. Um, so here's three things I wrote down. I mean, you can write down other version of this, but more or less the following three items are things that we would want. So the first item is that at any time during initialization or training, uh, the activation or pre-activation pre vector should have constant size coordinates. Here I wrote theta one, uh, or theta one here. Uh, that means uh, constant size as the width of the network becomes large. Okay, so all of the big O or big data will indicate some scaling with the width uh, or N of the network. Okay, so please remember this notation from now on. Uh, Okay, so all the activation pre activation should have constant size coordinates. This is very natural for various reasons. For example, uh, when you have nonlinear functions, uh, like you expect the input to the nonlinear function to be you know, in a constant range, right? So for example, for hyperbolic, hyperbolic tangent, the effective range of hyperbolic tangent is a constant interval around zero. If your network is, you know, if the input to the hyperbolic tangent is growing to infinity, then it's just like a step function. If the, the input to the hyperbolic tangent is concentrated around zero, then it's just a linear function, right? So the, the effective range of the nonlinear function is always a constant interval that's not shrinking or exploding with the width model. So, so the, the pre-activation being constant size you know, is very natural and as a result, the activation should also be constant size. Okay, so this is number one. Number two, the neural network output should be O1. So it, it should be, um, it should not blow up to infinity, but it could be zero. Uh, zero just means that the network is not certain, which is totally fine. But, but in contrast to uh, the activations, the activations cannot be zero because if the activation is zero, then you essentially get no gradients. Uh, you have no representation. So, so this is the, the contrast between the output and the, imbe the embedded uh, embeddings of the, the inputs which are the activation, pre-activation vectors. Okay, so these are you know, fairly natural assumptions. Um, and then finally, you want to train as, uh, as much as possible, learn as much as possible from the data. So you, you want all the parameters to be updated as much as possible without leading to divergence. Again, as much as possible is in terms of scaling in width. Okay, so uh, you know, when you, you know, you, there can be more discussion if we're gonna talk about, you know, how long should we train? That's a separate question. You know, we fix everything, training time, data size, whatever, uh, only consider the scaling with, with the model. Okay, so these are the three uh, desiderata 
or criteria that I consider to pin down what is a good parameterization. Okay, any questions so far? I mean, any, anybody objects to these three criteria? Anybody think we need to have some more other criteria? Yes. What? Oh, so you'll see you'll fall out of this. Uh, okay, so, so let's, let's see what this gives us. Okay, so it turns out, uh, and I'm, I'm, this is a claim that I'll justify later, but let me just describe the claim first. The click claim is that there's a unique parameterization which we call actual other parameterization, which is what you saw already in the last lecture, satisfying uh, the desiderata. And it's given by any of the four equivalent conditions. Okay, so the most key thing I'm gonna focus on here is actually this set of conditions on the operator norm, which is not the uh, perspective we took last time. Um, so what, the, what does this table say? So on the rows, we have uh, W0 and delta W. So W0 just means the initial weight, okay? And then uh, delta W means the total update to the weight uh, in due to SGD or any other learning algorithm. And so that like W the weight at any given time is W0 plus delta W, okay? So that's the decomposition. And uh, so these are the rows and then the columns are the, uh, the parts of the neural network. Okay, so the input weights, the hidden weights, and the output weights. Just think, in your head, just think a uh, multi-layer perceptron, right? So you have an input layer going from like, you know, say 10 dimension to a very large dimension, and then hidden layers goes from like, you know, a very large dimension to very large dimension, and then output layer goes from a very large dimension to 10 dimension, okay? Okay, so the claim is that, you know, like the, the, initialized, the initial weights and the updates of the weights or the different parts of the network should scale like so in terms of the width of the model, the width n, okay? Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about the details of this, the, the entries right now, we'll get to it in a second. But uh, for now, because it's, you know, this is a lot of information in this table, I want you to focus on the pink parts. So that's what we'll focus uh, most of our attention on to give you intuition. So, so what you wanna see here is that for the middle parts of the network, the block of the network for deep neural network, uh, the, the hidden weights, you want both the initial and uh, the updates of the weights to be uh, constant in operator norm, right? As width becomes large. So that's, this will be like probably the, the, the most important take home message uh, today uh, in this first lecture. So if you forget everything else in this lecture, you go to sleep, I still want you to wake up thinking that the operating room should be one for both initialization and the update for the hidden ways. Okay, so that's, that's the, that's, you gotta, even if you die, you gotta remember this. Okay, so now, uh, but I said, right, I, I said four equivalent conditions. So there are three other things that are equivalent to this. So you can equivalently describe the, the correct scaling. Instead, instead of operator norm, you can describe it in Frobenius norm. So you get this table instead. Okay, so if you look at the pink columns, uh, you see that the difference uh, of scaling, if you look at Frobenius norm instead of operating norm, is that the, um, for the, the initialization is square root of n instead of one, but for the updates it's the same, okay? Again, I'll, I'll explain the reason for why this, this should be uh, the right thing to do, uh, but let's move on and, and describe the rest of this key claim. So we can also describe uh, the, the size of your initialization and the updates uh, in terms of the entry size. So like, you know, if, uh, right, so the, in the middle layers, the hidden weights, there are, there are n squared entries in both W0 and delta W. So how large should they be typically? And uh, you'll get, you know, this kind of answer. Again, I'm not gonna explain the reason behind this now, but I'll do it in a second. Uh, and then finally, you can describe it in terms of hyperparameters, which are you know, what you actually control uh, when you do uh, training of neural networks. So the hyperparameters are the standard deviation of the initialization sampling and the learning rate for um, the parameters, right? Um, and uh, so here, um, yeah, the interesting thing is, uh, well, I want you to focus on the output layer. So if you recall from the last time, this is indeed exactly what we focus on in our MLP example, where we discovered that the right thing to do, or at least the, the more correct thing to do compared to standard parameterization is to scale standard deviation learning rate uh, like one over N for the upper layer, okay? Um, 
Okay, so this is the key claim. The key claim is that if you, uh, if you stare uh, at uh, these uh, conditions, then the only thing that will satisfy them uh, will be uh, this parameterization that will simul simultaneously uh, satisfy these four equivalent conditions. Okay. Okay. So why is this? Right. So again, the the the, the most important part of this whole key claim is the operator norm. From from the operator norm, you can derive everything else. So this is uh, what we're gonna talk about uh, next. I'm gonna skip this part. Okay. So the operator norm perspective. So these are the uh, the serrata again. Okay, so the, the key insight here is that um, if you want number three to be true, all parameters should be updated as, as much as possible without leading to divergence. Then for all reasonable data sets during training, any incoming activation X will correlate with W0 and delta W as much as possible in terms of scaling with width. Okay, so again, this is nothing here is precise. You just wanna pique your intuition. Um, but if, you, if you're updating things as much as possible, you, you, you're essentially saying all the weights should learn about the other weights as much as possible. So the incoming activation should know as much as about the weights as possible. And the weights should know as much as, uh, about the activation as possible. So roughly this translates to uh, the, uh, the, the statement that uh, when you hit uh, a matrix W0 or delta W with an activation, you're gonna roughly, you know, trigger the, the operator norm of it, right? So you're gonna like reach the operator norm of it, right? So, so you have this kind of equation from this key insight so that uh, W zero times X norm of this vector should be roughly equal to uh, within constant factor, the operator norm of W times norm of X, right? So if you recall, uh, you know, what the definition of operator norm is, it just means, it just says that like the left side is less than or equal to the right side. So the key insight here is that it's not less equal to, it's like equal to up to constants. And likewise, this is the same thing for delta W. Okay, so this is the, the key insight here. Um, right, so if you, if you train the network as, as much as possible, then like all the weights should be strongly correlated and you, you would hit, you know, this uh, operator norm limit when you um, do matrix multiplication. Okay, so with this in mind, you can see why um, in the middle, the operator norm uh, should be once, right? So if you have a, uh, if you want, you know, the, uh, oops, if you want the uh, pre-activation and activation vectors to have constant size coordinates, they're in, in coordinates, Right, so it's roughly translated to like square root of n norm. Then in the hidden layers, it maps a, a n-dimensional vector to an n-dimensional vector. So the, the norms should be preserved, right? The norms should be both square root of n on the input and output side. So this implies that the uh, operator norm of the hidden weights for both initialization and the update should be constant size, which is why this one here. Okay. Um, so Okay, so hopefully this, this, this makes sense. And then the rest of it, the, the square root n on the input and one over square root n on the output is purely because of dimensionality changes. It's purely because the input layer maps something from a, like, you know, 10 dimension to like something humongous, like n dimension. Uh, so you need to compensate for the change in dimension. So that's why there's a square root n here. And likewise, the upper layer is reverse. It maps a very large dimension to very small dimension. So you compensate that by uh, having one over square root n there. Okay, so, but essentially the, the gist of, again, the gist of the story is that you, you're training networks to, to uh, you know, as much as possible. So everything will correlate very strongly. And so you will hit that um, operator norm upper bound when you do a matrix multiplication, which will imply all of this once you account for the dimensionality changes between input and output uh, of each layer. Okay, so this is, again, the most important slide in this lecture. So I'm, let me pause here and, you know, let me know if anybody's confused or have any questions. Again, nothing here is like super precise, but hope you, hopefully like this, this short slide without too much math will give you, you know, 70% intuition.
Oh, yes. Hello. Yeah. So if we are bounding these spectral norms of the weight matrix, so won't it affect in the learning process? Because we are somehow saying um, we are kind of restricting the weight matrix, right? So still would it be able to represent all like neural network would represent uh, every function, right? <laughs> so it's a universal approximator, right? So by these bounds, so will it still hold? I mean, will it? Yeah, so, so in fact, this is the opposite of restricting the network. This is saying like, let, let you know, my, my, my little neural network, you should go fulfill your dreams, or whatever your dreams are. Like, this is saying that you should not trap the weights near the initialization of the network. Right? This is saying that like, uh, so, so consider the, the, the opposite uh, case where uh, you're literally at initialization. Okay, so look, then if you look at the first, um, first line, uh, for example, for the output of the network, uh, where like you're, you're going from a very large dimension to a very small dimension, uh, then this will not be true. And just because like X is independent from W, uh, zero, so that like you actually don't hit this. And so if you update the network very, very slowly near the initialization, you're not gonna hit this bound. So, so this is the opposite of saying like, you know, you will not be able to express anything. This, this is saying that you should train however you want so that you can express anything you want. And also is, I mean, is there some math to justify it? Or justify what? Uh, justify that this should imply, um, I mean, the operator norm should be one or like, are there mathematics behind it with just yeah, 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 this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So everything here can be made rigorous, but you know, I, I want to uh, use the least amount of words and slides to give you the maximum mm -hmm. amount of intuition. And this is the best I can come up with. Sure. Okay, anything else? Okay, so um, good. So um, please remember this. And then uh, if you recall, I said there are four tables that are equivalent to each other. So uh, there's one in corner size, uh, for example. So let's look at how we derive that uh, from the operator norm table. So the, the claim is that these two tables are equivalent. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, the easy thing is that if you look at uh, just the initialization W0, every entry is ID. So, uh, so there's nothing you know, like complicated about this. Is that everything is well known from random matrix theory. If you don't know random matrix theory, don't worry about it, but you can just look up. Like there's books or you know, Wikipedia pages where you can look up the translation between entry size and the operating norm. So uh, nothing, complica no, nothing complicated here for me to say. So again, you can just look it up. So the, the, the more non-trivial thing is uh, how do you translate the um, operating norm to corner size for the delta W? The update size. Okay, so so to demonstrate the logic here, let, let's consider a very uh, simplified case. So if you recall in gradient descent, uh, delta W is always a sum of outer products. So this is just uh, chain rule and product rule. Uh, so delta W uh, is is um, you know sum of gradients, and the gradients is uh, an outer product between um, the activation going into the weight and the, the gradient coming back to the weight. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's an outer product between two vectors. So let's just suppose for simplicity that delta W is literally uh, one outer product, outer product between two vectors U and V, okay? So let's see, uh, for this delta W, uh, can we derive the, the equivalence between operating norm one and then corner size one over N? Okay, so first of all, you know, this is the trivial thing to notice is that the operator norm of delta W is exactly e to the no, equal to the norm of U times norm of V. Okay, so this, is, this makes things super clean. And then the next observation, which is uh, really a non-trivial result from TP, uh, is that U and V actually will turn out to have approximate ID entries. Um, I mean, of, of course, in general, this, will not be true like for, you know, the arbitrary um, uh, computations, but if you, the computation is done via something called tensor program that I haven't really talked about yet, but like you can just 
think about like in neural networks, uh, uh, in, in neural network computations, U and B will uh, typically have approximately ID entries. So then let's pretend that U has entries drawn from random variable U and B from random variable B, okay, big B. Okay, then in this case, you can see that like this, the norm of U is roughly square root of N uh, times square root of this, uh, or the standard deviation of um, U and likewise for B. Then the operator norm of delta W is, you know, norm of U times norm of B, which is exact or roughly N times the standard deviations of U times standard deviation. Okay. And now I just reflect. You know, the re reflection is that uh, the operator norm of delta W is exactly N times the N here, N times greater than the, the, the product of standard deviations, which is exactly the, the entry size of delta W. Right? So each entry of delta W is roughly has, you know, typical size, uh, which is equal to the standard deviation of U times standard deviation. Right? So this, is, this, this gives you exactly what you want. So, you know, to translate from operator norm to coordinate size, you divide by N. To go back, you multiply by N, right? So that's the, that's the key intuition here. Uh, yeah. So in general, the same scaling applies if delta W is the sum of constant number of other products, uh, where the constant you know, is something that doesn't uh, depend on N. And this is exactly the case uh, we're considering right now, which is you train for fixed number steps with fixed batches while uh, the width goes to infinity. Okay, so uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then uh, another table is the Frobenius norm table. So again, let's focus on the pink. And this one is very easy. So again, like for the random part, W0 part, this is uh, standard. Like this is just random mixture series, nothing, uh, nothing new. And then for the delta W part, is essentially a rank argument. Like, you know, if you recall what I just said, uh, Delta W is always a sum of a constant number of outer products. So if, if the constant equals one, then this is very obvious, right? That uh, the operator norm and the Frobenius norm are on the same scale for delta W. Like, you know, for example, if delta W is exactly equal to the one outer product, U times B transpose, then uh, you can see that like the operator norm and the Frobenius norm are essentially the same. Uh, and this remains the same if the rank <coughs> is constant, uh, the number of outer products. Okay, and then finally you have, uh, you can derive the hyperparameters from the entry sizes. Uh, this is a little bit more involved calculation, but it's fairly straightforward uh, once you get down to write it down on paper. So I'm gonna skip over this one. Um, and, and here's the key claim again, okay? That uh, the unique parameterization that satisfies uh, any of the four equivalent conditions is UP. And uh, I mean, it is, the, the same UP that we talked about in the previous lecture, because this table is exactly the same as the table from previous. Okay. Um, okay, so let me pause here um, before I move on. Any questions? Okay, so let's move on. Um, so one advantage of the operator norm perspective uh, is that it allows you to quickly glance uh, the key properties of a parameterization, where the key properties of a neural network are very wide neural network under any kind of parameterization. Uh, so let me demonstrate some of this. So you know, suppose you have uh, you know some um, parameterization, you know, uh, given. Uh, a table of its operator norms. Okay, so, uh, you know, so you recall you know, in, in the last lecture, I presented these tables, but in terms of like learning rate and standard deviation, but now I'm kind of using different units, so to speak, and I'm presenting the operator norm table. And the, the point I'm trying to make is that if you have the operator norm table, instead of the, you know, the learning rate and standard deviation, and it's, then it's much easier to tell uh, the key properties of the parameterization when the network is large. So here, let me demonstrate um, uh, the, uh, how to do the, how to use the operator on table to, to tell whether the output of the network is exploding or not, or shrinking to zero or not. 
So the key claim here is that the, uh, when, you, when you have this table, uh, the output size uh, of the network, the scaling of the output size of the network uh, can be estimated uh, by doing the, the following calculation. So, uh, so there are two terms here. The first term is essentially like, you know, the size of the output initialization. So you're essentially just going to multiply the uh, operator norms uh, uh, in the in the first row, the W zero row, for all the all the parts of the network, and then you divide by square root of n. Square root of n just because things are not correlated, uh, all everything is ID initialization, so there's a, a square root cancellation here. Okay, so um, so this is the first part, and then the the second part. Uh, of uh, this uh, expression essentially uh, calculates the size of the output change due to training. And when you train the network, the, the output you know, will change because the function learns something. So what's the size of this change? Well, this says you should sum up over uh, all other paths of this table. So a path is just, you know, you go from left to right, but you, you know, at, at any given step, you, you pick between W0 and W. And um, yeah, and, and uh, you uh, multiply the entries in the path. And then you sum up all paths other than this top level path that goes through W0. Okay, so, so that's a formula. It's the output initialization plus the uh, output change to your training. And uh, uh, so these are examples of you know, patterns in, in this latter part. Uh, so in this particular example, we can see that you know, in the first term, if you take the product of top level uh, entries, it's just one. And then this one over square root n here, so this is in total one over square root n. And then in the second part, you can see that all other paths give you one. So, uh, so this, this is a sum over a constant number of terms. So in total, this is, this is like constant plus something shrinking to, to zero. So the whole thing is constant. Okay, so, so this, this means that the output of the network and so does not explode to infinity nor shrink to zero. Okay, uh, and if you recall, this is a roughly the calculation we did last time with an MOP, you know, with uh, uh, calculations with the standard deviation and learning rate. But now with the operator on table, it's like a very simple arithmetic of um, whether the size of the output will blow up. So, so this is perfect. Uh, Okay, so now let's look at a counterexample. Let's look at the standard parameterization, which is kind of the bad guy from the last time. Um, and uh, you know, I did the calculation for you. This is the operator on table for standard parameterization. It looks like this. Uh, so you can see in general, like things are uh, larger. You know, if you look at the right side, the, thing, the entries are larger than the new key, except for the input layer. And let's look at the example of a three layer neural network. So there, so there are literally three uh, sets of weights. And then if you do this calculation, first you see that you know, at initialization, uh, the, the output is fine. Right? Square root of times one times one, and then you divide by square root of n. So output initialization is constant size, right? Um, now let's look at the second term. The second term says, you know, let's look at all the other paths in this table, and then take the product of them and sum it up. But you can see that this, this path is the maximizing path. And this will give you, you know, n to the three halves. And then there's some lower order terms from the, the other path. So this implies that the, the network will, will actually blow up. Okay, so, uh, you know, which is the conclusion from the last. Again, so you can see that with this table, this operator norm information, things are much, much simpler. Fatality. Yeah, if you play Mortal Kombat. Um, so this is a you know a real phenomenon. Like this is you know not just like a toy example. So this is on, on a real transformer like GPT two, uh, GPT three style uh, network. You can measure the the blow up of the output of the network, which is also called logit here. And uh, the x axis here is the width of the network. So as you, you see, like as the width of the network becomes large, the the output of the network will blow up. So things are unstable. Um, uh, whereas uh, you know the the bottom is mu p. So the top is SP and the bottom is mu p. And you can see that uh, uh, things are all very stable. Okay. 
so you can fix the learning rate uh, by lowering it to one over n, then the output will not pull up. Perfect. Uh, and then if you know about NTK, like the, the NTK is essentially almost the same as standard parameterization with one over n learning rate. And if you do this, the same calculation, you see the output size will not blow up. Perfect. Okay, so now the other key thing, uh, key property of the parameterization that you can glance very quickly on the table is the feature learning. So this is what Lene mentioned earlier, um, that falls out of the, the Deserata. But essentially, like you can measure how much feature learning happens by looking at how much the feature kernel changes. The feature kernel is just the grand matrix of the embedding, the final layer embedding of the, the inputs. So if you have a, you know, like a 10 inputs, then the feature kernel is a 10 by 10 matrix. Okay, so um, the formula is almost similar to the previously, except that now you're only considering paths from the input to the last hidden layer. So for example, this is a path, uh, and then you take in product, and then you uh, divide by a square root of n. So here, the square root of, dividing by square root of n is a, is, a, is a different dividing by square root of n for the previous version in initialization. This is uh, because of changing dimension, because you're starting from a constant dimension vector, and then you're ending up in the n-dimensional vector. So there's a, you need to account for the change in dimension. But uh, otherwise, uh, it's very similar. You look at all paths from input to last hidden, you take product and you take a sum. So you know, in mu p here, for example, you can look at all the paths and all of them will give you square root n when you take product. So you, when you divide by square root n, you get data one. So this means that there's a constant amount of feature uh, evolution, which is great. It doesn't explode to infinity, so you know, like things will blow up, and it doesn't shrink to zero, so you're actually learning features. Um, yeah, perfect. And now let's look at uh, the bad guy again. So the the standard parameterization with one over n learning rate. So so this is one over n learning rate. If you recall earlier, I skipped. Uh, this makes the output uh, constant constant size, so the network will actually not blow up. And if you do the calculation here, you see that uh, you know, like the, the dominating path uh, from input to the last hidden is you know, something like this. So this will give you one, and every other path will give you no more than that. So one, and then times one over square root n will give you one over square root n. So this means that the, the entries uh, of the feature kernel will change on the order one over square root n. Another way of thinking about it is that the, the embeddings uh, the entries, each entry of the activation vector uh, will change only by something like one or square root of n compared to order one when it, where it is initialization. Okay, so, so essentially the features are not moving. You're not learning you know, any good representation uh, of the world data. So this is a very bad, bad thing, so epic fail. Uh, same thing for uh, uh, NTP. Uh, you can do the same calculation. Okay, so that's all I'll say about um, the operating room table and whatever, how, like deriving mu p. Does that all make sense? Anybody has any questions? I mean, uh, does this make uh, does does this uh, make the derivation from last time? Make more sense? Uh, like who, who says this makes less sense than the last time? Anybody? Okay, I mean, that's, that's good. I guess. All right, so the next uh, topic for the rest of the talk. Oh. Yes. Yeah, um, because I, in the end, uh, the size of the weights don't really matter uh, other than their effect on the activation. Like the weights don't really matter. Like in the end, you, all you care is about the activation.
That's right. Yep. You can make this, uh, so everything here can be made rigorous. I can write it on theorem for you, but I think the value of a uh, formal theorem statement is like negligible, you know, additional to all this intuitive calculation. So for talk, I think this is probably the best way to express the ideas. Yeah, but you can write down like a formal theorem that says, uh, um, yeah, like, uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, you, like, like the, 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 I mean, you, so essentially this formula essentially is exactly true uh, for uh, under like generic conditions, like, you know, rigorously. Yes. Oh, uh, so yeah. So when I say generic, like there is some like, generic condition on data in the sense, in the sense that like, uh, there is some, some corner cases where if like every input is orthogonal to each other, then there's like some corner cases where like, this is possibly not optimal, mm -hmm. but under generic conditions where, you know, the inputs should correlate or, as an example, uh, then this should work. But yeah, but not, there's no like detail with, you know, like assumptions about like, you know, human language or you know, natural data, natural image data or anything. And uh, finally, I guess like uh, there is a limiting uh, flow that this con or uh, equation that this converges to as n goes to infinity, right? Uh, the deterministic converges to the entire dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, will you be telling us what those dynamics are? Uh, uh, a, a little bit in the next lecture. Not this okay. One. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, well, maybe maybe a little bit in the next, uh, but not like you know. I don't write down any equations tell you uh, qualitatively what it looks like. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, okay, of course, I think that the, the star of the first lecture, like the crucial you know, money-making mechanism is that we can predict optimal hyperparameters uh, with new P for large new networks. But of course, like none of this derivation you know, said anything about really hyperparameters. Uh, you know, we talked about operating norms, we, we talked about um, you know, how, how, how should you scale I mean, certain hyperparameters, but there's nothing about why they should be optimal, why should you, why you should preserve optimality, right? So if you recall, you know, the, uh, this picture from the last time where mu p, right, will preserve the optimal hyperparameters as you scale the width. So why, why does mu p transfer hyperparameters? So this is, so this is a slide from last time. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can do a dot experiment if you're God, you can see how the optimal hyperparameters vary with width, right? So you can make a plot where x-axis is hyperparameter, y-axis is the width of the network, and then you plot uh, the optimal hyperparameter for each width, right? So if you're God, you can see this curve, but of course we're not God, so we have only limited compute. So a moral can only see a small segment of this curve, maybe like right here, right? Um, so how do the optimal hyperparameters flow with width asymptotically? This is a key question. And you know, in other words, like which parameterization do they follow asymptotically? Right? So for example, here, if you're God, you can see that asymptotically and the slope of this line or the parameterization that this follows is given by this orange dotted line. And as mortals, we can't see this, but we can try to understand what it should be from first principle. So in other words, geometrically, what's the asymptotic slope of this curve? And the answer to this will yield something that gives you hyperparameter transfer. Okay, so how do we do this? And uh, the solution turns out to be something like this. And we'll go through the details of this uh, in a second, but uh, as an outline, what you wanna do is that for each possible slope slash parameterization, you derive what happens when the width is large, All right? So you just, you do the math, this is purely mathematical. You consider all possible slopes, asymptotic slopes of this curve, and you try to understand, okay, when you go really, really, really high up, like what does the you know neural network look like? Uh, you know if if, it, if the optimal hyperparameters uh, really follow that kind of curve. And then secondly, you notice that you know for all but one slope or parameterization, the neural network at large width will suffer catastrophic defects. Okay, so you know in practice you you will have defects. Uh, you can you know, use something that's suboptimal. You have defects at finite width but the defects will be small and can, and can be covered up by other mechanisms. But when you take the width to infinity, uh, the defects will magnify 
by parameterization here you mean uh, optimal hyperparameter not like uh, the initialization scale those things right so par by parameterization i mean kind of like any a way to fill those tables right so like I mean, oh you do okay like a way to fill this table where you know yeah you can be operating norm here you can be like hyperparameters but just different in, at different coordinates so so like, so how do you scale the standard deviation of the initialization and how do you scale the learning rate of the updates for each part of the network? How do you scale? I thought like optimal hyperparameters are about the global learning rate that you'll be choosing in SGD. No, 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 not, not the global learning rate, like the learning rate for every single layer. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's very crucial that you do not only look at global learning rate. I and mean, that's a, one of the key lessons here is that if you only look at global learning rate, you're looking at the one dimensional slice of a true, like a, the true picture, which is a very high dimensional space. And then what, you know, if you don't choose the right parameterization, the one dimensional slice is farther and farther away from the optimum in the true high dimensional space as you scale. Does that make sense? So, yeah, so, um, okay, so. Is, aren't you saying that new parameterization is optimal uh, because I, it not, gives feature learning? I mean, it is optimal, but I'm not saying that yet. I'm, I'm telling you how to derive this fact. Okay, so so far you have only said that new parameterization allows for feature learning. Yeah, that's and now you want to prove exactly. that exactly. So okay. that's all I said so far, and now I'm I'm t I'm asking why should that imply that mu p is optimal, and I'm going through the logical steps that would tell you that. Okay. Great. So again, so to see this. Uh, you know, as a mathematician, and what you would do is the following. So, you, for each possible, you know, possibility of the asymptotic parameterization, you derive what happens when the width is large. And then you notice that for all but one uh, slope of parameterization, the neural network at large width suffers from catastrophic defects. And we'll, we'll look at what the defects are in a second. And this unique exception is mu p. So, this tells you that if, you know, anything can do it, it has to be mu p. Okay. Um, and this is uh, the essence of this thing I mentioned last time, the optimal scaling thesis. I mean, it says that if you want a parameterization that gives you hyperparameter stability and larger is better property, then you must correspond when you take the width or whatever the size uh, parameter to infinity, it must uh, correspond to an optimal limit. Like the limit must like not have defects in some sense. Um, and again, you know, you have something empirical here, you have something theoretical here, and this is a very uh, interesting and precious thesis that channels theoretical advances, mathematical advances directly to empirical advances. Okay, so now let's look at uh, this, um, you know, you, if you recall, right, I said uh, for each possible slope parameterization, we'll get the right what happens when the width is large. So this, that's what we're gonna do next. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so, so, like, without a question, this is true on the training loss. If you just look at how well the network trains on the data, without a question, this is true. If you, I mean, if you do everything correctly, if you, if you don't do mu p, then okay, I don't, that's not true. But if you do mu p, this should sort of, um, yeah, become better and better. Uh, and uh, then if you want to look at the test loss, you, then there's a question of, like, you know, like, do you have enough training data? Do you overfit or whatever? But if you take care of the overfitting issue, then you know, in test loss, you should also decrease uh, continuously with uh, increasing size. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. yeah, that's the bitter lesson. Uh, Sutton's uh, bitter lesson that, you know, in the long run, like because of Moore's law, like scale is, almost all that matters. Um, you want a simple algorithm that scales rather than a complicated algorithm that's like limited to a certain threshold of scale. So that's a better lesson. Um, okay, so let's come back to this. So uh, this is called a dynamical dichotomy theorem. Again, the purpose of this theorem is to say, here are, uh, here's a picture, here's a picture of all the possible parameterizations, uh, you know, asymptotic slopes, if you will. 
Uh, and then look, this, this picture tells you essentially all the possibilities that, in, that can occur when you take the width to infinity in any parameterization. Um, okay, so, so first of all, this is the true picture is a high dimensional picture. Of course, I cannot represent this in a slide. So this is just a character, some kind of projection of the true, true picture to two dimensions. But you get, it gets the idea across. So if you look at this um, picture, the thing you should take away here is that most of the region is not interesting. So it's unstable or trivial, which means that training blows up or training gets stuck in initialization when the width is large. All right, so this is not interesting. But if you squint closely, there's an island in the middle that actually does something non-trivial. Uh, and you know, this island includes you know, the standard parameterization with one over width and the newer tangent parameterization uh, as well as some of the, the maximum update stuff. But in this island, you, like the, the bulk of this, the majority of this, so like you know, the, in, the inside and also like most of the boundary of uh, this island uh, are in the kernel regime. So what, what kernel regime means is that if you look at the function evolution, the, the, the function evolution is actually governed by a relatively simple kernel equation. It looks like this. So the change the function at any given step is essentially like a linear in the last derivative of f at that time step. So k here is a fixed kernel that can depend on the architecture, the way you scale the network, but, but k is fixed throughout training. So you have this you know, rel like roughly linear equation, exactly linear if uh, loss is square loss uh, for the evolution of the, of the infinite width you know. Okay, so as a mathematician, this is very exciting because you, know, you have simplified this like enormous beast of a system, which is a neural, finite neural network. You don't know how to analyze it. And then when you take this limit, you, you simplify it to like a linear equation. Like this is like a massive you know, improvement in our understanding in some sense. So like as a mathematician, like, you know, you, there's no reason you shouldn't love it. But, you know, sadly, it has this tragic feature of not doing feature learning, which is actually what matters almost entirely, you know, if you're talking about GPT or whatever, all the things that we love about deep learning. So, so this turns out to be the wrong model to actually look at when you take width to infinity. You, I mean, if you care about like actually, you know, predicting something of value in practice, this is a the bad model, but I mean, if you are just mathematician, okay, whatever, you can do whatever you want. Um, so finally, you know, if you, again, like the bulk of this island is in this kernel regime, which is mathematically very clean, but you know, tragically not actually describing reality. If you screen very closely, there's an upper boundary here of this uh, polyhedron. And this, the, the parameterizations in this upper boundary actually does feature learning. So, so feature learning in the sense that if you look at the feature kernel, uh, the gram matrix of the embeddings, the entries of that gram matrix will, will evolve by a constant amount uh, over the course of training, uh, which is not the case here. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so you have feature learning and then also in contrast to this function evolution property here in the kernel regime, the function evolution in the feature learning regime cannot be described purely in the function state. Uh, so this is just some mathematical property that's maybe not super critical to uh, the optimality argument. <clears throat> but finally, like if you squint very, very closely, this is you know, peak here, this point, this vertex. Uh, the maximal update, which is the thing, the hero of our story. Um, and this is maximal in a very, you know, precise sense. Uh, roughly, you know, it means that all the layers are updated as, as much as possible. Like if you can learn features, you will learn features in any part of the network. That's roughly what it means. Uh, so I'll skip this part because we're running out of time. So hopefully this gives you some sense of what you know, optimal limit should mean on the right side. You know, like, so this is roughly the content of this lecture where the last lecture gave you notion of what optimal parameterization means, right? So again, the optimal scaling thesis says that these two like, are bijective. And so if you wanna you know, train the best model by using the best parameterization, then as a mathematician, you have a lot of opportunity to, to make progress on this problem by doing purely mathematics. And then I'll note that you know, this is a thesis for any notion of model size where we focus on width here, but you, know, you can talk about depth and other notions of scale. Okay, so this is uh, almost the end of this lecture. So let me pause and reflect before we continue to the next lecture after. Um, so stepping back, 
right? Like in physics, there are four well-known forces that we understand comprise our universe today. There's gravity, uh, electromagnetism, weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force. I mean, I think everybody has heard at least the first two, but the latter two maybe not so much unless you're a physicist. Uh, but uh, these are, you know, what we understand so far about our universe. And there are two incredibly successful theories that, uh, you know, um, uh, give us a lot of insights into our universe. So there's a standard model which governs, you know, like really small high energy particles. And then there's uh, relativity, which governs how like enormous objects at very far distances uh, interact, like planets and galaxies. Of course, you know, you must have heard of the theory of everything that Einstein was looking for, but, you know, it was elusive to him and still elusive to all of us. That fills the gap between relativity and standard model. That will tell us everything about our current universe. Okay, so this is what physicists are looking for. But also, but in deep learning, we also have fundamental forces. We have width, depth, training time, so on and so forth. These notions of scale. Um, and whereas this, this uh, what's so called the tensor programs framework that I'll talk about in the next lecture, uh, it tells you like a fairly, you know, almost as good as it gets um, theory of large width neural networks. There's much, much less on the other notions of scale. And in fact, you know, just like if you look at look uh, back, you know, a century ago, electricity and magnetism were considered two separate forces. But then Maxwell unified them into a single force. So it's, it's not even clear whether these are fundamental dimensions, whether they can be unified under one single notion. So right now is a ripe time for a search uh, of the theory of everything for large scale deep learning, where we understand exactly how we should transfer hyperparameters across these different notions of scale. You know, how should we allocate our resources across these, these different notions of scale? Um, and you know, in general, like what are all the possible scaling dimensions there are, right? And if you believe in the optimal scaling thesis, as a mathematician, this is very simple and it's a very lucrative job. So you just, you know, on the right side, you derive the optimal limit by you know, taking infinite size limits, classify all possible limits and find the optimal limit. If you can do this, you know, you can, you know, lead, lead a very good life. Uh, and uh, if you look at, you know, these things taking limits and classifying objects, these are exactly things that mathematics has been really good at. You know, classification of manifolds and you know, QFTs or whatever. So uh, I'll end here uh, to continue for the next lecture. Thanks.